Allah has given me enough for you. <laughs> so I didn't come with an empty cup. We want to talk honestly and forthrightly to you on part two of this subject, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X. 28 years later, what really happened? On last Sunday, I raised the question of motivation. Regardless to how good acts may appear or words may sound, the intention of the heart is what really makes the word or action good or evil. For instance, if there's an elderly woman who appears to be struggling with her groceries and I determine to help her across the street, that looks like a good act, doesn't it? On the surface, it looks good. But suppose my action was to get at her purse which was in one of her bags. Well, you might see me walking the person across the street. You say, oh, that's wonderful. That young man is so kind to his elders. But you might not see the person lifting the woman's purse out of the bag because the act of good was used as a cover to get across an evil intended action. We ask the question, what was the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's motive in raising Malcolm, in raising Louis Farrakhan, in raising a nation? What was Malcolm's motive in accepting the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and following his guidance and teachings? What was Elijah Muhammad's motive in silencing Malcolm? What was Malcolm's motive in breaking the silence? What was Elijah Muhammad's motive in setting Malcolm outside of the nation? And what was Malcolm's motive for leaving the nation? What was stated and what can we determine over time is the actual motivation. What motivated Spike Lee to make this epic film? What motivated Warner Brothers to put up the money? What motivated Warner Brothers to say they didn't have enough when it ran over the budget? And what motivated the move to Oprah Winfrey and Bill Cosby and Magic Johnson and other sports and entertainment figures to raise five million dollars that the movie could be completed. Did Warner Brothers run out of money? Could they not have advanced the five million? Why did Mr. Lee have to go to Oprah and Magic and Bill Cosby? What was Cupsonette's motivation? The moment the movie was out, Cupsonette said, Louis Farrakhan, Malcolm's arch enemy. Is Louis Farrakhan Malcolm's arch enemy? If so, why did Cupsonette say that?
Was Elijah Muhammad an immoral man? Was he an abuser of women? Why did Malcolm say that? Is Malcolm correct? Wait, wait, wait. Is Elijah correct? Is Malcolm incorrect? Is Elijah incorrect? To look in the hearts of people is really God's business. None of us can really say we know what is in the heart of another human being. However, when we look at words and watch actions, the words and the actions can tell us more of the heart of the individual. And if the words are magnificent and the actions are not congruent with the words, then the action tells us more about the heart than the beautiful words that one speaks. So if my people, as Sister Ava Muhammad said, are destroyed for the lack of knowledge, and Solomon said, get knowledge for it is the principal thing. But with all thy getting, get understanding. For it is only understanding that allows us to properly interpret facts. Not cook facts to make facts form a pattern that would be pleasing to us. But to take facts without touching them, without altering them, but seeing into the facts to properly interpret those facts. And when I say properly interpreting a fact, all of us see facts and hear facts every day, but facts mean different things to different people. But it is the right interpretation of facts that allows us to do the proper thing with facts. Wrong interpretation of facts does not allow us to be rightly guided. Are we clear? Yes, if we take the Quran as true, there are verses of the Quran that need and require interpretation. If the interpretation is correct, then the guidance flowing from the Word of God is correct. If our interpretation is faulty, then our actions in accord with our interpretation will be faulty. Are we in agreement? Yes, sir. Now, righteous people do not wish to be guilty of slander. It is not meet or right for any of us to slander Malcolm, to become so engrossed in emotional response to Malcolm's actions that we slander him. But again, on the other side of that coin, it is totally inappropriate for Malcolm to slander his teacher. Now, in the Holy Quran, and I, I must say, Sister Tainetta Muhammad, as I was on my way to the mosque, sitting in the car, I said, I want to base part of my lecture on this surah of the Quran, the same one that you 
spoke on but did not quote. You quoted the 111, so now I shall quote the 104. It shows you how when you're in tune, you know, God is the feeder. It says, in the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful, woe to every scandal monger and backbiter. Stop. In the Ma Maulana Muhammad Ali translation, he says, woe to every scandal monger and defamer. Well, some of us don't have any fame to defame. But the Quran is reciting a woe to every kind of scandal monger or backbiter or defamer. As I speak with you, how many of us have knowingly or unknowingly engaged in slander and backbiting? Allah says in the Quran, that he will hurl these kind of persons into hell because he hates scandal mongers and backbiters. In the footnotes it says, three vices are here condemned in the strongest terms. One scandal mongering, talking or suggesting evil of men or women by word or innuendo or by behavior or mimicry or sarcasm or insult. Second, detracting from their character behind their backs, even if the things suggested are true. There are certain things about people that are really true. But what is your intention of using what you know of truth about somebody behind their backs to lower their character or defame them? I would like to just deal with those two. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad did not care that Malcolm was a felon. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad did not care that Malcolm was a pimp, a dope user and seller and bank robber or robber, gambler, hustler, etc. Why didn't the Honorable Elijah Muhammad say, oh my God, a man like that should never be with me? Some of your organizations and churches today would never have accepted Malcolm as a felon as they don't accept our young people, women or men, who have a criminal background. Our young men and women who have criminal backgrounds are not honored members of the NAACP, the Urban League, and they're not really honored members of their church because there's something in their backgrounds that is not harmonious with those who want upward mobility and don't want to be pulled down by association with criminals. <laughs> but the same Jesus we preach about sat with publicans and sinners 
And when the Pharisees berated him for so doing, he said, quote, it is the sick who need a doctor. A sick man who comes to a doctor is not berated for being sick. Otherwise, the doctor has no reason for existence. The reason that you would want to take up medicine is because there are sick people who need help. So when a person comes to you sick, you don't say, what are you doing sick? Don't you know that all sickness is sin? Get up out of here. You say, what is the problem? How long have you been troubled with it? Then as you search the history of that kind of symptom, you say, oh, I think I know what that is. Let me prescribe something for you that you may be rid of your illness. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad knew what Master Farad Muhammad, his teacher, did for him. One of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's sons said that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was in terrible condition before he met Master Farad Muhammad. He used to drink, and he was so drunk, one day he was stretched across the railroad track. And somebody had to come and get him, lest the train chop him in many pieces. Well, I don't know how many of you have been drunk like that. But you don't throw off on somebody who's a drunkard when you know you've been one too. You don't throw off on somebody who's a drug addict when you used to be that. You have compassion for the drug addict if God heals you from it, don't you? Because you know the hell that every drug addict is going through by the hell that you went through. Is that right? If you have ever been in prison, female or male, you know the hell of prison life. So if you are able to come out of prison and make a change in your life for the better, don't you have some kind of compassion for a brother that's doing hard time or a sister that's doing hard time? So God don't need to send no angel after you. Because an angel wouldn't know what to do with you. God has to raise one from the midst of you that knows your condition and your suffering, that would have the compassion necessary to work with your condition and mind until he makes us well. So what was the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's motive? in calling Malcolm out of darkness, in calling Farrakhan out of darkness, in calling you out of darkness, even those of you who don't claim to be Muslims, what did you learn from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and what was his motive for teaching? Was it to make money so he could live in a mansion on Woodlawn? Was it to ride in nice cars? What was his motive? His motive is all wrapped up in his mission. It is motive that gives the fire to what you do. And the more proper the motive, the more sustained the action. You better listen. Somebody, I don't want to use that example. <laughs> Let me put it like this. I'll walk with you a little ways if I really say I want to help you. But to suffer with you till you make a change in your conduct and in your life may take years. Nobody does that but a mother for her errant child. 
or a man of God who is entrusted with the responsibility of the reform and transformation of the life of a people. Elijah Muhammad's life was transformed and he was about the business of transforming human life. Malcolm was one of those lives. What a joy to correct a pimp. What a joy to correct a hustler, a thief, and a robber. Look at what was brought out of Malcolm. Malcolm was raw genius, buried in prison. And the prisons are filled today with the genius of black men and women who need what Malcolm received. As I mentioned last Sunday, Malcolm didn't just read a dictionary or read Plato and Aristotle and black history and become a teacher that transforms human life. The dictionary has never transformed one individual. Neither has Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, or any of those fellows. And if the Bible alone transforms human life, why isn't your life transformed? If you didn't read it, somebody been reading it to you and you go to church a negro or a what not and you come out the same negro or what not that you went in so your life is not transformed by the reading of a book you can go to the mosque and sit down and somebody can read ayats or verses of the quran that don't transform human life Otherwise, the whole Islamic world would be transformed by the reading of the Quran. It's not the reading. It's not the preaching. It's the Spirit of God in the revealing of the inner meaning of his words that sink deep into the hearts of the listener and gives the listener the will to start the process of evolutionary change from dust to the manifestation of divine. And I don't care what mosque or church you attend, if that imam or sheikh or mullah, if that bishop, that priest, does not have the spirit and the right understanding of the word of God, they'll never bring about a transformation in human life. Malcolm's life was transformed. And all of you who claim to love Malcolm, you don't love him enough to look deep into what transformed his life while you claim him from your lips you live and act like the nigger that Malcolm condemned come on and talk to me while you claim Malcolm with your lips you don't have any power with all that you know to transform the lives of suffering black people. You can give them knowledge, but you can't make them make a change in their lives. Because you don't have the power. It is not with you. It is not in the college. It is not in the university. It's not in Mecca or Medina or in Al-Azhar in Egypt. Malcolm had power to transform human life. 
When I heard Malcolm preach, I heard a man versed in the Bible, versed in the Quran, versed in the prophecies, versed in history, and he brought everything that he had read in prison and other places to bear on the Word of God. But the Word of God was primary, not secondary. You revolutionists, you nationalists, the thing that you hate is religion. Yet that is the thing that gave you Malcolm X from the very beginning. Do you deny that? Then how can you love the apple and hate the tree that produced the apple? Are you a liar? Are you ignorant? Or are you a damn hypocrite? What are you? Some of you have gotten so hip in your revolutionary nationalistic ideology. You don't want no God in your life. But Malcolm was moved by God. It was God that Malcolm represented. It was God that empowered Malcolm. It was God that gave Malcolm the mind to stand up against the government of America and all that the government represents. It was not any dictionary or ideology. It was God, raw, pure, and simple. I was with Malcolm one day with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And the people wanted to know what was the secret of the nation of Islam's success in transforming drug addicts and making them clean. The sociologists wanted to learn. I was with Malcolm at Harvard University and at Boston University when Dr. C. Eric Lincoln invited him to address some of the leading social scientists in America. They wanted to study this phenomenon called the Nation of Islam. What is Muhammad using? How does he do this? And Elijah Muhammad told Malcolm, said, when they ask you, you tell them. It is our belief in Allah. Well, we don't want that. And that's why you're still the same old Negro nigger and colored person, and you'll always be that when you reject God in your life. Well, I don't want the God that the white man taught us about. The white man ain't never taught you about God. The white man used God's name as a cover for his evil intention to rob and rape and pillage the people of the earth who were seeking God. And this is why he painted God as a white man. So he could get you to bow down to the image of himself. He didn't teach you no religion. That's why in the church, Reverend, you don't have the power of Jesus Christ. You can only preach an empty word, but you don't have the juice to turn the people to God and to clean up their lives and give them power. You don't have that, Reverend. If you got it, you got to come get it from us. had a, a dear reverend visit me 
He said a thousand members of the so-called gangs had visited Push. But when it came time for them to come, they wanted to come, and they did come. But he admitted, he really I had a little loss to know what to do for them because they don't have the power or the knowledge to transform human life. I'm not knocking us, Reverend. I'm not putting us down, Reverend. Please don't misunderstand me. But there is no white man's school of theology. Right that intended from the beginning to bring you to God. If you got to God, you got him on your own. They didn't intend to bring you there. If you found God, it was because you were looking for him. But it's not because they taught you. They gave you empty philosophy, moral jargon, doctrine, rituals, and then sent you out to do what? To entertain people? To find new ways to bring music to the church so that the people can jump and shout and, and whatnot? No, you talk to me, because that's not what church is for. Jesus didn't have no timpani five walking with him. He didn't have no guitar, no banjo, no drum, no singing group with Jesus. Getting on down while the master was working out. Jesus didn't have none of that. Jesus had a pure word with power in it from God. Prophet Muhammad was a simple man, but the revelation of this Quran with the spirit of Muhammad enabled him to transform human life. Malcolm had that power. I loved him so much. I never had a father. I never knew my father. My poor mother tried to rear me as best she could. She was such a strong black woman with no man in the house. But when I met the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, I met a man, somebody that I, as a young man, could pattern my life after. And right after I met the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, I met Malcolm and I heard Malcolm preach. And I never heard a man talk like that in my life. Such boldness, such strength. I can imagine how some of your minds are blown when you hear me so boldly. You don't get boldness on your own. Malcolm didn't come to Elijah Muhammad bold. He got bold when he met a bold man. I got bold when I met a bold black man. I always wanted to be brave and strong, but I was like that cowardly lion in the woods. I needed somebody to give me a dose of courage. So when I met the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm, I was meowing. I was trying to roar, you know what I mean? But it just wouldn't come out. Like some of you. You really want to be a man. You really want to stand up. You really want to help your people, but you don't know how. You've been in church, but you don't know how. You got a PhD, but you don't know how. You've been in the lodge, but you don't know how. You've been in secret fraternities, 
but you don't know how. It's all right not to know, but it's not all right not to know and not to know that you don't know and not to seek the knowledge after you know you don't know. I loved Malcolm because to me the greatest man in my life was the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Yes, and the motive that Elijah Muhammad used was his mission from God to resurrect us from mental, moral, spiritual, social, economic, and political death. That was the motive. But he had another motive sitting up under that motive like there's a root and then there's a tap root you may think you're at the root but there's another root below that root like there's a meaning under the meaning under the meaning under the meaning and if you keep going far enough under the meaning you'll find God but surface dwellers will never find God Surface dwellers will only find that which is on the surface. All riches are buried. And anybody that wants to become rich and doesn't want to dig deep into the earth for its treasures or deep into the ocean for its treasures or deep into the consciousness of self or deep into the reservoir of knowledge will never get wealthy with wisdom if you just want to be a surface dweller satisfied with little then there's a little on the surface for everybody but if you want to be like god you got to keep digging for more and more knowledge malcolm had an insatiable desire to learn he was a voracious reader. Everything of value he could get his hands on, he read. But he didn't just read to read to read to quote. He read with understanding because he was given a criterion by which he could judge the knowledge that he received. Most of you are like intellectual pigs. I'm going to say that again. Most of you. I like intellectual hogs. See, a hog has no digestive system. The cow will chew it up here. It has three digestive systems. It's getting it together. And every time it's digesting, it's separating this from that, that only the best will get down to become a part of the body and the rest will be cast out as waste. But when you're a pig, Everything you eat becomes a part of you so that you become a big barrel of educational swill. So this little piggy went to market and this little piggy stayed home. But wherever those pigs were, they did not know how to differentiate truth from falsehood and the value of real knowledge from theory and so white folk laid on us a whole bunch of mess and he called it education and knowledge and book learning and we like the pig kept our head down <laughs> slurped it all up And then when it came time to produce, we couldn't produce nothing. White folks know that what they've given us as knowledge is a joke. But the wise among us who have buttressed and complemented what they give with self-knowledge are able to look into everything that they teach and separate the wheat from the chaff and take the wheat into the storehouse of knowledge 
and act on the principles thereof. Elijah Muhammad's sub-motive was to make helpers, to help him in the awesome task that God had laid on his shoulders, the task of raising up a dead nation. Elijah Muhammad was not a selfish man. He was not a man motivated by greed. He wanted people to help him get to you with the word. And everybody that came to him, he would search them to see if they would make a good laborer. And even if they were a plumber and just knew how to sweat a pipe, he would show them how to sweat black people together. Can you do that? When Malcolm went to Philadelphia, Malcolm got a job as a painter just to make a little money. And he wrote the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and told the Honorable Elijah Muhammad he had gotten a job as a painter. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad wrote him a letter saying, do you want to paint, paint the walls of men? Or do you want to paint the hearts of men with the truth? In other words, just like Jesus, he found Peter fishing. He said, come on, get up out of there. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. Why are you going to make me a fisher of men, Jesus? Because I got a mission. And my mission is to retrieve men out of the sea of sin. Will you help me? So Peter came, James came, John came, Mark came, Thomas came. But they didn't, he didn't find them doing the thing he was doing. Wasn't nobody on that gig. Nobody had that job. So now you're going to make a laborer, somebody to teach black people? Yes, that's what I really want. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, everybody that came like the words of Jesus before me was a thief and a robber. He praised Marcus Garvey and he praised noble Drew Ali as forerunners. And he honored their work and told all of his followers that it was a good work and a noble work. He didn't like the preachers because the preachers were on the payroll of the slave master. He didn't like the preachers because the preachers were more interested in hooping than in teaching. He didn't like the tune of a preacher. He didn't like it if a man started breaking. Uh, 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 I went there that morning. Uh, were you there? Uh, he didn't like that. He didn't want none of his ministers to sound like that. He hated it. He said, teach the people. Preach to the people. No more. Listen to this. When he was teaching one day, he came home from the temple. Master Farad Muhammad was there. And so Master Farad asked the others, how did he do? And they were saying he did well. He really preached. He had, there wasn't a dry eye in the temple. Master Farad got a very stern look on his face. And he told him, brother, don't you make my people cry. I came to wipe away their tears. Even if you're teaching good, don't make the people cry. So that's why when we teach, we come before the people with a happy spirit. I teach always with a smile. Because I got good news for you. Your day of suffering is just about over. 
If you're going to cry here, you're going to cry for joy. When you're trying to make a laborer, a worker, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad did not want proud people. He wanted us to be humble. And you know how some of us were and are. We got these big egos with nothing in our heads. We are very arrogant. We can't wait to get an authority over somebody so we can show off, you know, how powerful we are. Jesus had all that trouble with his crazy disciples. And Elijah Muhammad had all that trouble with us. He was like a man asked to perform a delicate operation with a screwdriver. And he did the best he could. And Malcolm was the best that had come to Elijah Muhammad to represent this teaching. Of all Elijah Muhammad's ministers, in my judgment, Malcolm was top shelf. He always kept the Honorable Elijah Muhammad out front. Wherever he spoke, he said, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught me this, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught me that. In fact, when he came to the nation, they were calling Elijah Muhammad Mr. Muhammad. Isn't that right? Yes, but when Malcolm got here, they started calling him the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Malcolm introduced that. He wanted to see the leader in the dignified position that a man of his quality should be in. Malcolm knew what he was doing. He honored and respected the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's family. He loved all Elijah Muhammad's children, and he was treated by Elijah Muhammad as one of his own sons. Elijah Muhammad loved that man, and that man loved Elijah Muhammad. I never saw a man more fierce in defending Elijah Muhammad than Malcolm X. I learned basic things from Malcolm. He was a wonderful teacher. He was such a good example. I never heard Malcolm cuss. Every now and then on the rostrum he would say hell or damn. But I never heard anything else. I never saw Malcolm smoke, drink, or even hint that he needed one. I never saw Malcolm eat in between meals. The teaching of Elijah Muhammad was one meal a day. And in the 10 years that I knew Malcolm, I never saw Malcolm eat in between meals. Malcolm was a praying man. When I would stay in his home, he would get me up at 4.30 so we could make Salat al-Fajr. Malcolm was devout, but Malcolm was revolutionary. And he had a character defect, as we all do. But I heard the Honorable Elijah Muhammad say that his strength was his greatest weakness. How can a man's strength be his weakness? I've seen men come in the nation and when they hear the law taught by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, they have the strength to live it. And they became captains, teachers of the law. But they were so strong in the law till they couldn't countenance the weakness of their brothers and sisters in their failure to live up to the law. So their strength became their weakness because they weren't tolerant enough of the shortcomings of others to raise them up to a level of strength. Some of us are like that. Have you ever noticed some of us who can give exercises? 
and do jumping jacks three four five six hundred seven hundred eight hundred nine hundred a thousand we get in front of a class come on we're gonna do jumping jacks and we're gonna jump jack till he falls out just to show I got the endurance I'm greater than you see that's sickness that's imposing your ego and your vanity on your class Elijah Muhammad a marvelous teacher he taught us humility and one day he said to me because I used to boast a lot I didn't even realize how arrogant I was and sometimes you know the eye beholds everything else except itself and so, you know, you're looking out, but you're not looking in. And I found myself to be arrogant, but I didn't know this. And the messenger would listen to my tapes. And one day I sat at his table and he said, brother, you can tell the righteous. They walk the earth in humbleness. And he pointed to the Holy Quran. He says, Allah loves not any self-conceited boaster. For their boasting is in his ears like the braying of an ass. And the braying of an ass is the most hateful sound in the ears of Allah. Then he said to me, brother, no matter how heavy you are, you can't step through the earth. Now some of you in here pretty heavy. <laughs> some of you weigh over 300 pounds. <clears throat> and next to some of these thin ones, you may feel like a giant. But go stand up next to a mountain and see how big you are. So he says, since you can't step through the earth or equal yourself up to the mountains, why not take your place as one of Allah's creatures and be humble? These are the lessons that he taught me. He taught Malcolm. He taught Brother Abdul Allah. He taught us all, didn't he, brother? And when we messed up, didn't the Honorable Elijah Muhammad have a way of teaching us and spanking us and punishing us that he made us better? You belong to organizations. These organizations ain't trying to make you better. You be the head honcho. You, you, yeah, you. What is your reason for being the head honcho? You shoot straight. Whatever that means. Ain't nobody trying to make you a better person challenging you when you mess up but Elijah Muhammad challenged us whenever he felt that we vip when we should have vopped or deviated he would stop us and upbraid us and correct us and reprove us and admonish us and he whipped Malcolm many days to make Malcolm a better man you weren't there what do you know about it Malcolm you fell in love with was made by somebody and the Farrakhan that you have fallen in love with is made by somebody much bigger than he is you weren't there when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad chastised us you don't know anything about that man's ability to chastise his son is in the audience. His son will tell you. Nobody came to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad that didn't get a whipping. I'm going to say it again. Nobody came to Elijah Muhammad that didn't get a whipping. Am I telling the truth? Did we get whippings? We did. Sometimes we didn't think we deserved them. And he would beat us on general principle just to see if we had the humility to take a beating when you think you're right. You didn't hear me? 
I'm telling you what he did to me. I'm not before you as the kind of man that I'm becoming in no vacuum. My mother didn't teach me this. Elijah Muhammad put me on the radio to make a broadcast. He said, brother, I'm going to try you at this broadcast for four weeks. And he sent me a letter and he told me what he wanted me to preach. He said, and I will let you know after the four weeks if I want you on any longer. <laughs> after the four weeks, I came back smiling. <laughs> he said, that was pretty good, brother. Uh, you can go on for another two weeks. This time you say what you have in your mind. After the other two weeks, which made six weeks, he said, well, brother, I'll give you six more weeks. And he listened. Every time I would make a tape, I would have to send it to him first. He would clear it, then he would send it throughout the country. You know how it is when you get a lollipop that somebody gave you that's theirs? and you start sucking on it till you think it's yours? <laughs> and then they ask you to give it back and you get an attitude? <laughs> the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, listen to this carefully. He said, well, brother, you can go on now for six years. And all the while I was making the broadcast, I would write each word down and measure each word. It would sometimes take me a week just to make a half hour broadcast because I strove for perfection. That's the discipline that my mother gave me in trying to make me a musician. I never performed a bad performance, never in my life. I worked hard at my craft so that I could always give my best. My teacher told me at the end of three years, he said, brother, don't write your speeches out. Just go and stand up. I said, don't make any notes. He said, no, brother, just go stand up and let Allah speak through you. And I did it for four years. And then I did it everywhere I went. I never would rape, make notes. And I can wake up in the morning in the dead of the night, sleep and preach. And call scriptures from everywhere without looking at a note because I studied eight, nine, ten hours a day. And I studied my teacher. One time in the broadcast, he said, brother, I'll be coming back to the radio next week. Let the people know. Now I've been sucking on that lollipop a long time, brother. Elijah Muhammad said, I want it back now. You've been saying I was coming back. Now you can tell him I'm back. I made a tape. Hearken unto the voice of God. Because see, one thing you can't fool a man that's that wise, he listened to your words, how you form them, he listened to the inflection of your voice and the spirit of you, and he can tell whether you want him to come back or whether you feel bad that he would take his own broadcast back. Like I'm telling you right now, I'm standing in his place. This ain't my place. So I can't get too used to his seat. He may claim it. I'm living in his house, not mine.
I may get a knock on the door one day. Do you live here? <laughs> so man, in words, should never get comfortable with borrowed goods. And everything you got belongs to somebody else, so why act like it's yours? Always act like what you got is from God. This is God's work. Now let's get down to business. What was Malcolm's motive? Let me tell you the arrangement that Malcolm and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had, which maybe you may know about or may not know. If the Honorable Elijah Muhammad told Malcolm, I'm going to put you out front and make you known that you will make me know. What kind of deal is that? In the days of Moses, Jehovah was not known. Jehovah put Moses and Aaron out there so that they could become known, so that they could make Jehovah known. So Elijah Muhammad put Malcolm out front. Was Malcolm out front? It wasn't that we didn't have nobody else in the nation that could talk like Malcolm. Stand up, Brother Abdullah, step out here. His brother was formerly known as John Shabazz from Los Angeles, California. He rivaled Malcolm in eloquence, in brilliance, and in his ability to captivate audiences. He had the fastest growing mosque in the nation of Islam. We had ministers all over the country taught by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Some of them may not have been, have been as eloquent as Malcolm, but he had many that were just as. I just wanted to say that Elijah Muhammad didn't just produce one Malcolm. He produced a whole cadre, and every one that he taught was a powerhouse in his own right, in his own city. Malcolm was just the out front man. So whenever we went to Harvard or Yale or Howard and we all were around Malcolm, none of us would speak. Malcolm spoke for us, we were quiet. The press would say, well, what do you think? We said, speak to the spokesman. We had that kind of discipline. So when they couldn't get a word out of us, they got it from Malcolm, so they elevated Malcolm. That was the plan, elevate Malcolm, the articulate spokesman of the wisdom of Elijah Muhammad. And Malcolm was supposed to become a big man and introduce the world to the man that taught him and made him. It was a good arrangement. But what was the government doing all this time? Do you think the government liked the nation of Islam? Do you think the government liked Malcolm? When Malcolm stood up representing the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, that was an unbeatable duo. Did you see how the enemy writes the FBI files that they work night and day to divide Malcolm from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad? What tactics did they use? Part of the tactics was to keep Malcolm in the press as the leader. To incite jealousy among those of us who followed Elijah Muhammad and knew that Malcolm was not the leader. We never followed Malcolm. We were followers of Malcolm too, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. But the press, Malcolm X and his Muslims, they kept pumping Malcolm up as the leader. And then Malcolm had to almost degrade himself to keep from being looked at as the leader. So Malcolm would say, I'm like Charlie McCarthy. Some of you young people don't know who Charlie McCarthy is. 
But the older ones know that Charlie McCarthy was a wooden dummy. And Edgar Bergen was the ventriloquist that manipulated Charlie McCarthy. So Malcolm would go in front of the public and really degrade himself by saying, I'm like Charlie McCarthy and Elijah Muhammad is like Edgar Bergen, meaning he is the one pulling my strings. And he was not lying. Every major speech that Malcolm made, he would go to the phone and call the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad would give him the outline. Malcolm would fill it in, and the press would marvel, and you would marvel at the wisdom of that man. But he was a microphone speaking the wisdom of a man speaking through him. You were benefiting from Malcolm, but you were benefiting from Elijah Muhammad through Malcolm. You don't like that, do you? I'm sorry, man. I can't tell you no lie. So that's all you're getting from me is a benefit from Elijah Muhammad through me. I'm not the author of this. But you all love to worship the students and crush the master. Something about Elijah Muhammad that you just don't seem to like. He was a strange man, uncompromising, unbending. They called him a strict disciplinarian, and he was that. He didn't like foolishness, and we couldn't carry on no foolishness around him. Wonderful teacher. Well, when Malcolm was the big man, I was like a little uh, imitation, I would say, of Malcolm X on the East Coast. Everybody that knew me knew that I loved Malcolm and knew that I taught a lot like Malcolm because I adored him. And if you see the film clips of Malcolm, you see me somewhere sitting, cheering Malcolm. And then sometimes you see me looking at the rooftops and looking because I was a soldier. Yes, and I would have given my life to stop a bullet for Malcolm because he, to me, was the greatest representative of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. What happened? What happened? Now, this is a difficult part. But sometimes, Brother Ayman, that's the oldest son of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in our audience, those around the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and sometimes even members of the family, didn't always understand why the Honorable Elijah Muhammad did the things that he did. Now, this was a simple thing. This is my sister, Tainetta Muhammad. Would you come out, Sister Tainetta? I'm going I'm to uh, give an incident in our Islamic life to illustrate a purpose. And I happened to see Sister Muhammad when she became a Muslim in 1958, February the 28th, in Detroit, Michigan. I was present. Sister Tainetta Muhammad has a love for art, for culture, for music. But her greatest love is Allah and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the Word. So she would take this word and form it into plays. And since I was in show business, I took the word and formed it into music and drama. So one day, I came to see the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and he said, brother, did you write that play, or did you take it from uh, Sister Tainetta Muhammad's play? The Night of the Storm. I said, sir, I don't know anything about the play. He said, well, don't worry about it. We'll straighten it all out tonight at dinner. At dinner that night, it was Sister Clara Muhammad, Brother Wallace D. Muhammad, Raymond Sharif, John Ali, Ethel Sharif. They were all around the table. We had gotten finished the soup. Usually the messenger let you drink the soup. 
And if there was a case that he wanted to get on, he'd at least let you get the soup down. <laughs> so you wouldn't go out the door totally hungry. <laughs> Sister Muhammad, you can go and sit down. <laughs> Thank you. But I'm making a point. That night, Elijah Muhammad said to me, he had his handkerchief in his hand. He said, brother, you did take uh, this play from the sister, didn't you? I said, no, sir, the apostle. He said, brother, you did take it. <laughs> Malcolm saw that play and came and told you about it, and then you wrote yours, didn't you? I said, no, sir, the apostle, I, I didn't take her play. And this time I'm really getting upset because I'm innocent. And Sister Clara Muhammad saw him beating on me and she wanted to come to my defense. And he said, she said, he, he said he didn't take it. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in a stern way said, Clara, I'm handling this. So she, she became very quiet. And for the next 10 minutes, he proceeded to beat me and beat, you did take it. And then he would give scenarios of how I took it. <laughs> so now I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. I can't be going back and forth with him, arguing with him. It don't look right. You arguing with your teacher, even if you're defending yourself from a false accusation. I didn't know what to do. I said, I know he don't want me to lie. So I said, well, dear apostle, I, I did exactly what you say I did. <laughs> I put it back on him. He took his handkerchief, he threw it down. He said, well, all right then. Then when things quieted down, my head is almost in the soup. He looked at me and said, brother, I was defending you all the time. Now in my mind, I said, what kind of defense <laughs> was that? He was accusing me of what my detractors who may have been around that table were saying about me. So he took up their charges and hurled their charges at me. He said, brother, I was waiting for you to say that you wrote your play in 1956. She didn't come in the nation till 1958. How could you have taken yours from her? I was waiting for you to accuse her of stealing her play from you. So I said, well, I couldn't accuse her because we both came under your teaching. We didn't know anything about John Hawkins' history until you taught us. So if we wrote a play, we wrote it based on your knowledge. So really, the play is yours. And he looked around the table as if to say, you see? Then later, as I was going out the door, he looked at me and said, you and my son Wallace, Go and mop up the wilderness. He was testing me. And then years later, he said to me, if you really want to see what's in a person, accuse them of something that you know they're not guilty of with a straight face and keep it going. And before long, what's really in them will come out. Now, why would the messenger do that? He wants to know what's sitting up in you because you're going to be elevated. And if there's something negative sitting up in you that you're hiding under the right pressure like cooking a pot, you'll see what the smell is if you cook it. So Elijah Muhammad is no fool. He tested Malcolm. He tested me. He tested his son. He tested his daughter. Did he test you, brother? Did he test you, Jabril? 
Did he test you, Sister Tanya? Did anybody ever come to Elijah Muhammad and, not, uh, and was not tried? Well, did he try Malcolm? How did he try Malcolm? And what was his purpose in trying Malcolm? I want you to listen, because this is very important. Everybody said Malcolm was the heir apparent. You know what that means? That when Elijah Muhammad was no longer present, Malcolm would sit in his seat. Do you know what kind of character you got to have to sit in the seat of a redeemer? One mission to save a people? Do you know what kind of bearing and patience you got to have to sit in that kind of seat? When Master Farad Muhammad told Elijah Muhammad, take plenty, you're going to suffer from your people. You can't be vindictive and sit in the seat of Elijah Muhammad. You got to take the suffering and roll with the punches until you can resurrect God in the person that is buried under the rubbish of this world's life. You can't be a low character man and sit in the seat of Elijah Muhammad. Malcolm being the quote unquote heir apparent had to be tested more than anybody else. Because if Elijah Muhammad departed from among us, Malcolm would be the one that everybody would look to for leadership. Now, how do you test a man like that inside his own house? When you go to the dojo, how many know what a dojo is? My God. How many know what a gymnasium is? Oh, thank you. A dojo is a place where you go to learn the martial arts. How many of you have any knowledge of martial arts? Would you raise your hands? You do? Okay. The sensei or the master who is teaching you, how does he prepare you for combat? He takes you to the threshold of pain, doesn't he? And when you get to your threshold and you can't take no more, you hit your leg, let him know, hey, hey, hey don't go no further. <laughs> then the next time you go back, he increases your threshold. How many of you have lifted weights? You know that when you're doing repetitions, you're breaking down the muscle fiber in order to build it up. So every time you call on it to go one more, even when you think you can't go, go one more, lift it again, lift it one more time, you're breaking it down. But the next time, you can take a lot more because that's the way you train. How do you train a man who's going to sit in the seat of a redeemer of a people? How do you train him? In every organization, in every church, where there are black or white people, there's always envy and jealousy present. There's not one of you in this audience who has accomplished anything in this life that hasn't been met with the envy and enmity and jealousy of some of your peers and others who see you progressing in the face of their not being able to make as much progress. And isn't it painful to have people that you grew up with, that you love, turn on you because you have some advantage that they want for themselves but don't have. Isn't it painful to have somebody turn on you because of a gift that God has given you? 
please, this is very important, very important. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, the three most hated men are one, the person who is wealthy and gives away his wealth to the poor, two, the person who is wise and teaches wisdom to the ignorant, and third, the man to whom the Holy Quran is revealed, the three most hated men. The person to whom the Holy Quran is revealed is the most hated of all because he's wealthy, he's wise, and he shares his wealth and his wisdom with his people. So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was the most hated black man among us. Talk to me. In the 60s when we were in the civil rights struggle, was Stokely Carmichael hated more than Elijah Muhammad? Kwame Ture now. Was Whitney Young, James Farmer, James Foreman, Martin Luther King hated more than Elijah Muhammad? No. Elijah Muhammad was the most hated of all because Elijah Muhammad was the wisest of all and he shared his wisdom with fools like me. And he made us wise. So the white man kept seeing more strength coming after him because Elijah Muhammad was not a man of show. He was a man who made men. With all due respect to my brother and friend, the Reverend Jackson, how many little Reverend Jacksons has he produced? And how many little Martin Luther Kings did Martin Luther King produce? And which one of Martin Luther King's disciples are carrying on Martin Luther King's work today as Martin Luther King demanded? Talk to me. Elijah Muhammad knew that every living thing must die. And he was looking for us way on into the future, so he prepared ministers and teachers and persons who would lead. And if Malcolm was going to sit in the seat of a most hated and envied man, Malcolm would have to be able to withstand the insults, the arrows, the darts, poisoned with envy and slander and backbiting and evil words. And he must not strike out at them because he is to redeem them. And as long as they didn't make a physical attack against us, we didn't care what you say. But if you made a physical attack, then we'll give you all of the business you need. <laughs> and that is the way it was. And that's the way it is in 1993. We're not going to bother nobody, but if anybody attempts to bother us, we'll give you all the hell that hell can take with the backing of Almighty God. Make no mistake about that. Hold on. All praise is due to Allah. Now, I'm coming to the critical part of this lecture. Among the Panthers, among the NAACP, the Urban League, and, 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 and Maulana Karenga's group called Us on the West Coast, and among the Nation of Islam, there were agents of the FBI. And you know what? They're among us today. They say, I saw him, so like him. <laughs> they never kind of get it right. The best agents, they get it real right. Because their aim is to get up in the mosque 
and get into the secretarial department where the facts and the figures are. Their aim is to get into positions of leadership and their aim is to watch the leaders for any weaknesses so that they can bring about tensions and disruption in organization because the white man don't want to see black folk organize. Well, you know that J. Edgar Hoover, the, um, the um, <laughs> J. Edgar Hoover, <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> J. Edgar. He had plants everywhere. J. Edgar Hoover hated Martin Luther King, and J. Edgar Hoover hated Malcolm X, Kwame Ture, or Stokely Carmichael. He hated the Civil Rights Movement. And while Martin Luther King and the big six in civil rights were sitting in Washington with Lyndon Baines Johnson, and even with John Kennedy, they were planning the death of Martin Luther King Jr. Jesse sat at my table. We had coffee together. I said, Reverend Jackson, you're in some very powerful circles and I know you hear a lot of things. And I'm sure they're telling you things about how they're gonna move on Farrakhan. <laughs> I said, but I just wanna remind you, my dear brother, and while they were talking about moving on Malcolm and Elijah, they were already planning the death of Martin Luther King. I said, they don't trust you, Jesse. I said, no matter how close you get, Reverend Jackson, they know they can't trust you because there's too much God in you. You'll only go so far and then the God in you will yank you back. So I said, they will never give you what you think you deserve. My words have proved true. Malcolm, our great spokesman, in 1963 was beating the dickens out of John Kennedy. John Fitzgerald, Malcolm called him John the Fox because the liberals had gotten control of the black struggle. And guess what? 30 years ago, Malcolm was the number one anti-Semite, according to the Anti-Defamation League, in the black struggle. Wait now, you didn't hear me, did you? I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna say that again. 30 years ago, Malcolm X, according to the Anti-Defamation League and the dossiers that they put out on Malcolm, was the number one anti-Semite among black people. And you know why they called him anti-Semitic? Because it was Malcolm X who exposed the liberal Jewish conspiracy behind the civil rights movement. Do you know who the first person was to bring to us the protocols of the learned elders of Zion? Fact or fiction, whatever it is, Malcolm brought it to us. And do you know who the first person was to expose that the real leader of the NAACP was a Jew? It was Malcolm X. And the real leader of the NAACP, even though they had blacks out front, it was Spingon. And the real leader core and SNCC in the civil rights movement, they were Jews. Now, why did the Jews hook up with you? I mean, this is not anti-Semitism. This is just fact. Why did the Jews hook up with you? Why aren't they hooked up with you too tough today? Because the purpose was accomplished. They got with you because you were discriminated against, right? So were Jews. So it was a natural alliance. They picketed with you, but their motive was different. We're going back to the intent now. Why did they picket? 
Because they knew once you broke the doors down, you weren't in a position to take advantage of it, but they were. So when the doors were broken down in the civil rights movement, the Jews walked in, took over Miami Beach. Talk to me. Jews got more political power, more economic power as a result of the civil rights struggle. Gays came to prominence, women came to prominence, and blacks are still singing, we shall overcome. Is that right? Don't be mad with me. Don't be angry. That's not anti-Semitic. I don't hate Jews. I just know the truth. But now, Malcolm was busting the civil rights movement. Malcolm was knocking Dr. King because Elijah Muhammad, his teacher, was knocking Dr. King. What? Yes. Elijah Muhammad looked at Martin Luther King as one of the number one magicians of Pharaoh. <laughs> what? <laughs> Wait, let's not get emotional. Please, sisters, don't get angry. Martin Luther King was a PhD in theology. If you know anything about the prophecies, the prophecies do not our integration with Pharaoh. It talked about separation from Pharaoh. So now Malcolm was preaching separation. Elijah was preaching separation. Martin Luther King was preaching, I don't want to be your brother-in-law. I want to be your brother. So you can beat us. We're going to love you. You can drag us. We're going to love you. Because it was scientific nonviolence. But Malcolm was nonviolent. And you not either. Hell, if nonviolence as a philosophy would work, we need to start preaching it immediately in the black community. Because we sure need to be nonviolent in the way we're killing, maiming, robbing, raping, and destroying one another. That's where you need to practice nonviolence. But when you're going to be nonviolent to an enemy who is persecuting you, see, but what Martin Luther King was doing, he was taking young men and women and marching into places where he wanted us to be able to sit down. Well, Elijah Muhammad said, don't go where you're not wanted. If they don't want you in their restaurant, why bother? Get on the south side and build some just as beautiful as they got on the north side and go to your own restaurant and spend your money with your own. Now, you may say that Elijah Muhammad was wrong, but the moment we could go to the white man's restaurant, all our black restaurants closed down. The moment we could sleep in the white man's hotel, what happened to our hotels and our motels? Did they close down? What happened to black economics? It nearly died in the South because integration put the money in the white man's pocket and took it out of the black man's pocket. Talk to me. Malcolm saw this. Malcolm never was an integrationist. Malcolm never died an integrationist. That's a lie. Malcolm was a realist. But as Malcolm was reaching the public on the outside, another dynamic was taking place on the inside of the nation. And what was that? Envy jealousy because Malcolm was getting headlines while some of the other ministers weren't getting anything. Some of the top laborers in the nation were jealous of Malcolm because he had the attention and the affection of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and they didn't like it. So any little evil report they could bring on Malcolm, they would do it. Like, you can see this in every organization, right? Well, I didn't think that that would take place in the nation of Islam. Now, wait a minute. We're the same as you. 
Elijah Muhammad didn't wave any magic wand and all of a sudden we became saints. It's a process. And while we're in the process of becoming, we act out some crazy drama. So Elijah Muhammad sat back and would say little words to direct the jealousy toward Malcolm and then watch Malcolm to see how Malcolm reacted. Malcolm would come to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and, and state his case. Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, well, I don't pay that no attention, brother. Go right on with your work. How do you know this, Farrakhan? Because I walked in Malcolm's shoes. I can tell you a lot about his feet that no man can tell you about. Because I walked in his shoes. Malcolm could not take the enmity and the strife of his own brothers. And he would come to Boston where he was always accepted. I was the minister there. And he would tell me, I'm just going to quit. I'm not going to go around and try to help no ministers and preach in their mosque. I'm just going to leave it all alone and go back to New York and build New York. I said, well, Minister Malcolm, don't, don't put me in the mosque in Boston out because some others think like that. I don't think like that. He was being worn down. And guess what? In 1963, Imam Waratuddin, the son of Elijah Muhammad, came out of prison. He was sent to prison for not going along with the draft, as you recall. He came out of prison in the winter of 62, I think it was. The winter of 62, wasn't it? And in the winter of 62, I came to Chicago to sit with the imam, to talk with him. He had just come out. And in his home was an apartment here on the south side. The present imam, Wadid Dean Muhammad, asked me if I would go and tell Malcolm that he had something that he wanted to tell both Malcolm and myself, but he wanted to tell us both together. So he asked me, would I tell Malcolm that he, Wallace D. Muhammad, wanted to see Malcolm and myself? I called Malcolm and told him what Wallace D. Muhammad had asked. Malcolm was the kind of man, he don't want to hear nothing if it's important with his student, meaning myself. So Malcolm went by himself to Chicago and met with Imam Wadid Dean Muhammad, who was then Wallace D. Muhammad, who had just come out of prison and learned that his father had taken wives from among the secretaries. When Wallace D. Muhammad told that to Malcolm X, Malcolm, <clears throat> I guess, was blown, but he understood it from the Quran. He understood it from the Bible, but the hurting thing. Do you remember the sisters that spoke last week? How many of you were present? You know the first sister that spoke? Sister Evelyn? Malcolm was in love with her. When she was growing up in Boston, she became a Muslim in Boston and Malcolm was teaching in Boston. And they were to marry. And Malcolm at that time was organizing mosques for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and he didn't want to marry at that time. Sister Evelyn came to Chicago and became a secretary of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And unknown to Malcolm, she became a wife. And she produced a child, which you saw last week, that gorgeous, beautiful daughter of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. 
Well, you may say, well, why? If it was such a, why was it a secret? Why didn't y'all tell the believers? They, they would have understood, yeah? Would you really? I've been working with you now for nearly 40 years. I think I know a little something about black people. Though the Quran says that a man can have up to four wives, it tells the man that one is better for him if he but knew. The Quran also says, do justice by your wives, but you cannot. But do the best you can, because when you have more than one wife, one is going to be favored over another. It always happens that way. Well, why did God allow what is called polygamy? Is God a disrespecter of women? Does God think so little of women and their pain and suffering that he would give his prophet a right to women to hurt them, to abuse them? No! Look at you, sister. You're like women whose men are at war and the ranks of the black male is decimated. Either we're in jail, listen good. We're on drugs, we've turned into homosexuals, and the woman is sitting here without a decent man, without a real man to look to, to comfort her, to guide her to be a real husband for her. She's a suffering black woman, outnumbered or outnumbering men, three, four, five, six to one. So you're all fighting over the few little men that's left. And the one that you got, you wish you had left him alone to get somebody else. Women are so valuable in the sight of God. He will allow something that is not the best to keep the precious woman from falling into that which is worse. Prostitution is a hell of a thing. Lesbianism is a hell of a thing. Fornication and adultery is a hell of a thing. Since God hates fornication and adultery because it robs family. It breaks up family. And if you look in the Bible and Quran, God's laws are very harsh when it comes to anything that interferes with family. Because family is the basis of a nation and anything that interferes with marriage ruptures family, and anything that ruptures family ruptures nation, and that's why adultery in the Old Testament is punished by death. Fornication is punished by death. Homosexuality is punished by death. In the Old Testament, Moses would not even allow a man to wear woman's clothes, he'd be killed. And women couldn't come out in no man's clothes, you'd be killed. You can't play no man. You may want to be one, but you can never be a man. I don't care how hard you try to toughen up your faith. And I don't care how hard you try to be a woman, brother. You ain't got it. Never will have it. Any man that want a real woman is a damn fool to lay up with a man. But no man can give you what God put in a woman for you. No man. No man. 
We're messed up. We're off course. We've been bamboozled. We've been hoodwinked. We've been took. We've been had. <laughs> Ain't that what Malcolm said? We're almost finished. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad knowing that if the believers knew that he had taken wives, what would they want to do? Uh-huh, come on. Every old brother dissatisfied with his wife would be looking among the sisters. There's my number two. There's my number three. And before you know it, he's old jive time brother with no job. He'd be over here talking to you and all the three women would be on welfare and he's sitting up at home waiting for the check. That ain't being no man. Y'all all right? If you don't know how to handle that knowledge, it's best that you don't know. So those sisters suffered to protect Number one, the messenger, and to protect us from a knowledge that we might not have been able to handle if we had that knowledge. And third, to protect their children, which is the bloodline of the most hated man of all. Now, if they don't like Elijah, do they like his children? They're afraid that his children will be like him. And if he's giving the white world hell, what will his children do? This was no plaything. A man of Elijah Muhammad's means could pay for abortions. If it was just a sexual thing, a man don't have to have babies. Hey, girl, you know, get rid of it, you know what I mean? But Elijah Muhammad did not want sex. He wanted children. I'm not going to say he didn't want sex. Pardon me. I said he wanted children. I got to be real about everything. Because <laughs> 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 you sure can't have children without sex. That's, that's, that's for sure. But I'm saying that's not the motive. The motive is that the seed of a man chosen by God must not be wasted. You don't think God understands the suffering of women and wives in situations like that? Sister Clara Muhammad was devastated when she heard it. That's a faithful woman who worked hard and all her knowing life. She told me that she don't know nothing she has done in 40 years that she couldn't stand before Allah feeling absolutely uh, ashamed. She didn't know anything she had done to be ashamed of. That's what she told me. It's a good woman, a righteous woman, but like any good woman, hurt. She wasn't going to permit it if he went to her and said, now, it's time for me to take wives. What? <laughs> there ain't no black woman got sense, you know what I mean, except you've been trained that way. And in the Islamic culture and in the culture of the Hebrews, they grow up that way. So it's easier. We grew up in the Christian West, where everybody talks monogamy and lives polygamy. Can we get a witness? Um, so when Malcolm found out through the Imam that Evelyn had gotten pregnant from the messenger. He was hurting. And with all the envy and jealousy of the ministers, he began to think that his teacher 
was jealous of him too. So when he made that statement on the death of Kennedy, that it was a case of the chickens coming home to roost, and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad silenced him, Malcolm was hurt. I want you to hear me well, ministers, because there are times in your life with me as mine with the messenger that you think when a man is doing something for you that he's doing something to you. And your own perception, based on whatever is in your brain, may not allow you to see your leader's actions in the proper way. When Malcolm began to doubt Elijah Muhammad, and doubt is the mother of hypocrisy, when Malcolm made the statement about this, uh, the assassination of Kennedy as the chickens coming home to roost, and the messenger said, in the public, Malcolm was not speaking for me. He was speaking for himself. And I have silenced Malcolm for 90 days. Two things were accomplished. One, three things were accomplished. He showed the public that he was not with any statement of mockery of the death of the president. When our brother got killed in Los Angeles by the police, a plane full of Georgia citizens went down. All of them were killed. Malcolm got on television and said, God answered kill that whole plane load of crackers for our brother. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he didn't use the word crackers, you know, devils. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad called him in and said, no brother, you don't make mockery of death. Even though what you're saying is true, you don't look like a civilized man if you would stand up in the face of death and mock people who are grieved over the dying and their relatives. Even the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when a Jew's beer or casket was walking by, Prophet Muhammad stood and he asked his companions to stand. And when the beer went by, they wanted to know, why would you stand for the coffin of a Jew? He stood, he said, in respect for the angel of death that must touch all of us. Elijah Muhammad was trying to make Malcolm a statesman. And so Malcolm, in mocking Kennedy's assassination, Elijah Muhammad took him out of the public to keep Malcolm from being assassinated. But Malcolm misperceived because he already had the seed in his mind. My teacher's jealous. The ministers are against me. So he wanted to fight back. And how did Malcolm choose to fight back? That Sunday, the first Sunday that Malcolm was sat down, I was the minister that was asked by Elijah Muhammad to speak in Malcolm's place. And I spoke in New York and Malcolm came. Malcolm could come to the mosque, he could run the mosque, but he couldn't speak. He was still in control. Malcolm picked me up in that same Blue Oldsmobile that's over there in Malcolm X College. And we drove across the Triborough Bridge to his home in East Elmhurst, which later became the home where my wife and my family stayed. And Malcolm and I sat down to dinner and Betty was in the kitchen. She had made the food and she came in and served it. And Malcolm told me that Elijah Muhammad had fathered children from two of the secretaries from Boston who had become his wives. And as Allah is my witness, I will never lie 
by the grace of God. Malcolm said, I'll get Evelyn and Lucille on the phone and trick them and make them say that Elijah Muhammad is the father of their children. I said, you don't have to do that for me. Your word is sufficient. He said, well, what do you think about it? I said, I think that there's no God but Allah and that Muhammad is his messenger. And as, wait, wait, as Malcolm was taking me back to the airport, he said, brother, I don't want you to tell anybody what I've told you. I said, no, sir, I'm not going to tell anybody but the messenger. See, one of the things about the nation, in the dead world, you call that snitching. You don't believe in that crap here. You start speaking against the leader, it is my duty to report my mother. Because it's bigger than mama, it's bigger than daddy, it's bigger than this little jive friendship you got. When you're dealing with the messenger of God, anything against the messengers against the life of the nation. I had to report to the messenger what Malcolm had said. That's the way I was trained. And it was Malcolm who trained me. When I said I would tell the messenger, he jumped. I got on the plane and went back to Boston. My wife was sleeping in the bed. I couldn't sleep all night long. I'm turning, tossing, mine all messed up. 5 a.m. the next morning, Malcolm calls. Brother Lewis, I want you to delay writing the messenger so I can get my letter off to him explaining what I said. I said, well, brother, it's going to take me some time to get my head together to write the letter. And if you can get your letter off to him in that time frame, please do so. I said, I don't want to be caught in no struggle between two powerful men. He said, there ain't but one powerful man. I said, well, you've got that right. That morning, since I couldn't sleep, I went in my little office and I opened my Quran. And as God would direct my hands, I opened to the 33rd chapter of the Quran, which deals with the domestic life of Prophet Muhammad. And when I started reading about the wives of the Prophet and what the Christian missionaries said about him and the slander on the Prophet, I said, this is it. We can defend him. I called Malcolm back. I said, Malcolm, I found something in the Holy Quran. I'd like to come over and talk to you about it. He said, come on. I had $28 to my name. It took $28 to get from Boston to New York and New York back. At that time, it was $14 on the shuttle. That was a long time ago. <laughs> I got on that shuttle, and Malcolm picked me up at the airport, and we drove around. And I want you to listen to me carefully. I told Malcolm what I had found in the Quran that would allow us to defend the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And as God is my witness, Malcolm said these words to me. He said, I already know it. He said, but you can't handle it, Brother Lewis. I'll handle it. You leave it alone. I said, yes, sir. So I went back to Boston. But in the meantime, Malcolm is spreading this to other ministers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Malcolm is still talking underground to the press because Malcolm had made up in his own mind he was going to leave the nation. So this is December. By February, we had Savior's Day. This is the first time since Malcolm was in the nation that he missed a Savior's Day. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad allowed me in 1964 to bring him on 
to be the speaker that introduced him. In March, before the 90 days of his suspension was up, Malcolm went before the world and said he is leaving the nation of Islam because he felt he could help the messenger better outside of the nation than inside the nation. Now you all may love Malcolm. No, I have no problem with that. But when you have organization, there is no individual more important than organization or nation. Individuals sacrifice their lives for organization and for nation. So no matter how much we love Malcolm, when Malcolm is wrong and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad disciplines him, that is to strengthen organization. And if Malcolm loved organization and nation more than his own pain, Malcolm would have submitted because Malcolm was wrong. But Malcolm was angry and Malcolm was bitter and Malcolm was hurt. He went to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad prior to his announcing that he would leave and he questioned Elijah Muhammad about whether this was true that he had fathered these children and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad didn't deny it. He said yes. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad told him, hey brother, I am fulfilling what is written of me in the scriptures. Malcolm knew the scriptures. He knew that Elijah Muhammad believed he is the messenger of this Quran. And as the messenger of this Quran, he had the right by God's order to take wives, whether his wife liked it, whether you liked it, whether I liked it, it don't make no difference. If God orders it, he carries it out. The wisdom of God. I'm just about finished now. Malcolm went out of the nation. We all were hurt. At least I can speak for myself. I loved him. Next to Elijah Muhammad, I didn't know anybody greater than Malcolm X. It hurt me that he would go out of the nation. But then the worst hurt was Malcolm going to Mike Wallace telling Mike Wallace and listen to the words now Elijah Muhammad fathered children from his teenage secretaries so Malcolm raised it to a moral issue listen to me carefully putting himself in the righteous position putting his teacher in an immoral position, but then he's going to the white man to tell the white man what his leader and teacher had done. He did it with Mike Wallace. You can't deny this, this is actual fact. He came here to Chicago and went to Cups in it. When has Cups in it been a friend of black people? And he told Cup. I thought he was a man father these children and wouldn't in other words kept it a secret and whatnot I found that that he was less man than I thought oh. he dogged the messenger the man that took him from a pimp from a hustler from a stick up man and send him before the world now he's dogging his teacher. What do you think we felt? Elijah Muhammad wasn't just a leader. That's our spiritual guide and father, brother. You don't have to order me to kill you. If you attack my father, my orders come from my love. I want you to hear me good because Every Muslim that loved Elijah Muhammad would have killed Malcolm if we had gotten a chance. 
Now, I don't need no damn applause. I want you to think now. We didn't incite that. Malcolm incited that in us. He would have been dead. He would never have lasted a year. Elijah Muhammad told us, leave him alone. Leave him alone. Told me to my face, leave him alone. And I'm an obedient servant. Yeah, I love Elijah Muhammad enough that if you attack him, I will kill you. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And I'm not a killer, but neither are you. But if somebody attack what you love, each one of you in here would become a killer instantaneously. Am I lying? Mother, let somebody look like they're attacking your child. Here's a woman who fought a bear because the bear snatched her baby. And she ran the bear down, screaming until the bear dropped her baby. Love casts out fear. We don't give a damn about no white man law when you attack what we love. And frankly, it ain't none of your business. What have you got to say about it? Did you teach Malcolm? Did you make Malcolm? Did you clean up Malcolm? Did you put Malcolm out before the world? Was Malcolm your traitor or was he ours? And if we dealt with him like a nation deals with a traitor, what the hell business is it of yours? shut your mouth and stay out of it because in the future we're going to become a nation and the nation got to be able to deal with traitors and cutthroats and turncoats the white man does deals with his the Jews deal with theirs Salman Rushdie wrote a nasty thing about the prophet and Imam Khomeini put out a death thing on him and it stands today. A certain path you don't cross. Like I said last week, in every prophet's community, there were zealots. I'm telling you, Elijah Muhammad told us, leave that man alone. I believe Elijah Muhammad said he'll come back repentant, leave him alone. At the same time that Malcolm went out, Wallace D. Muhammad went out too. And wrote in the Daily News, Chicago Daily News and Sepia Magazine, such ugly things about his father. And if it were not for the mercy of that father, that son would be dead, killed by one of his own brothers. But Elijah Muhammad said, leave him alone. Malcolm was his son. Aaron, yes, but leave him alone. You're not to judge him. Leave him alone. And we left him alone. I'm going to tell you something about the nation. The nation that I love. Some of these rotten ministers and leaders and captains were in the nation yesterday and some are in the nation today. You don't like the way of God. If God say put them out in your heart, you want 
You, you don't think that's strong enough, so you want to beat somebody up or you want to exact some kind of retribution on somebody as though you are God beside God. You don't like my way because I'm a merciful man. Some of you are hypocrites right now. Honorable Elijah Muhammad didn't send me to beat black people or shoot black people, but to teach black people. And you'll always find me defending black people because he showed me how to defend my people. But you know, sisters and brothers, in the Bible, David had a son called Absalom. And Absalom rose up against his father, David, and violated David's wives in the presence of all of Israel and made war on the father. And when the father's forces went out to meet the forces of the son, David told Joab, when you catch my son, don't kill him. Bring my son to me. Absalom had long hair, according to the Bible, and he was caught up in a tree. And Joab, even though the king said, leave him alone, Joab wanted to be a law unto himself. He allowed his emotion and his hatred for what that son had done to take control and he speared Absalom through. And they brought the son of David back dead. And while all of Israel was rejoicing, you could hear David in his tent crying, saying over and over and over again, my son, my son, my son. I had an experience with this. Have any of you ever had an out-of-the-body experience? <clears throat> well, if you haven't, I have. I was in Boston, and all of a sudden, my spirit seemed to rise right up out of my body and I could see myself floating above the trees and the highways. And I found myself in Chicago. And as I was coming around the house of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad at 4847 South Woodlawn, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was in the room of Warath Dean Muhammad. And he was sitting on his bed, on Wallace's bed, looking toward the door with his back to the window. And he was crying the deepest cry that I ever heard a man cry. You know, when a man cries and he's coming up from the gut, deep, 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 and he was saying over and over and over, my son, my son, my son. And I said to him through the window, the apostle, I will be your son. And he never turned to acknowledge my presence at the window, so my spirit returned. And I watched myself go right back and get into my body. And I woke up and I started reading the Bible and found the words of David and know that I heard the cry of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad over both Wallace and Malcolm. We have zealots in the nation and we have agents in the nation. I believe the zealots in the mosque in Newark, as it has now come out that they were from the Newark mosque, killed Malcolm. But the hurting thing is two innocent men went to prison for 25 years of their life. And they were sentenced to a prison term that they didn't deserve by the mouth of Betty Shabazz. Betty was so hurt 
at the death of her husband. Being in the marsh, she knew Thomas Johnson and Norman Butler, and she placed them at the scene of the crime when they were not there. And this same Betty, so vindictive and hurt, I can understand the hurt, got on LIB in New York and said that I, as well as some of Malcolm's brothers, were a part of an assassination committee to destroy her husband. Hypocrisy is a hell of a thing. So in my conclusion, the FBI knew that Malcolm was going to die. How did they know? Who informed them? In Spike's movie, when Malcolm was in the hotel, you saw the bug in the lampshade. <clears throat> That's to throw you off the track. They may have bugged the lampshade, but the scripture says, where there are two or three of you gathered together in my name, there I am also among you. That's the way it is with the FBI. Wherever there are two or three of you gathered together for whatever your righteous purpose is, that enemy agent is right there among us playing like he's one of us. So the zealots, like Joab, could not respond to their leader's instruction. Their hatred for Malcolm was greater than their leader's instruction. Somebody told Malcolm, Take the guards off the door. Don't let them search. And Malcolm went along with it. Malcolm was very confused, very upset. If you listen to his talk, you watched him when he was clean and firing. Then when he got his beard and he, he was disheveled and he just didn't have it. And the same people that he whipped in debate began to beat up on Malcolm. Poor brother. Poor brother. He was writing to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to get back in the nation when he was assassinated. No uniformed policeman, nowhere in the ballroom but an agent. Gene Roberts was one of his bodyguards. And when Malcolm fell under the bullets, it was this agent who claimed to be giving Malcolm mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. It was an agent in the Panther Party that told the authorities where Fred Hampton would be sleeping. And they drugged our brother. And they shot so many holes in that apartment on the west side, there was no way that Fred Hampton and Mark Clark could have lived, and anybody that got out of there was lucky. It's always been agents and stool pigeons that set us up for the big devil. Was there an agent among those who assassinated Malcolm? Why were two arrested at the ballroom, as I said last week, and only one later was mentioned in the paper? One was dropped and dropped completely out of sight. When Spike Lee, and I'm going to tell you something about Spike. You may not like Spike. That's my brother. I love him. I think I understand him. 
Spike read the autobiography of Malcolm X. Spike fell in love with Malcolm, as many of you did. Spike was hurt that such a great one was lost to us. And Spike believed that Elijah Muhammad had him killed. And he makes a hint ever so slightly in his book, The Making of the Movie Malcolm X. He makes a hint that in his heart, he wanted to get even with Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam. So when Spike and I talked, and my son-in-law asked Spike, <clears throat> have you ever read the Holy Quran? Didn't you ask him that, Brother Leonard? What did he say? He said he had never read this book. So we asked him, on what basis are you going to judge the domestic life of Elijah Muhammad if you don't read and understand the book out of which he acted? Do you think that Malcolm X gave up Elijah Muhammad because of some sex thing? Do you really think it's that shallow? How could he? How many wives did Prophet Muhammad have, Brother Baghdadi? Some people say nine, some people say 11. Now, when Malcolm was slandering the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, talking about teenage secretaries, didn't the prophet take a wife who was a pre-teenager? What was her name? Aisha. When he married her, how old was she? She was 11 years old. But he did not have conjugal relations with her until what year? They say 14. Well, Malcolm, how are you going to leave Elijah, who had wives, some of them young women? And that man took you up out of the mud and cleaned you up. You didn't know nothing about no Prophet Muhammad. Prophet Muhammad didn't come and get you out of jail. It wasn't Umar, it wasn't Ali, it wasn't Abu Bakr, it wasn't Uthman. How you gonna say you gonna dump a man that cleaned you up and then go follow the prophet that had 11 wives and one of his was a pre-teenager? Does that make sense? Come on. You know anything about Malcolm? You ever read his words, studied his, his teaching, or what he taught from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad? Do you think Malcolm could go to Mecca and be bamboozled? Hoodwink? I've been to Mecca many, many times. I ate food out of a bowl with white people brown people, red people, yellow people. I drank water with black, brown, red, yellow, and white in Mecca. That didn't change me and make me think that there's no racism in Islam. I'm not no fool. And can nobody fool me as I know what I'm looking at. Why in the hell is Africa so backward? Why won't the Saudis Back Africa, back to Somalia. There's suffering in Somalia. Why didn't the Saudis send money there to feed them? Why you don't back the Muslims in Bosnia? You got some problems. You're not going to fool me that there is no color in Islam. You tell that to some other person. You don't tell that to me. I know better. Why are Muslim Arabs in the black community selling pig to my people?
you know it's divinely forbidden, but you sell it. Yet the prophet said, a man is not a Muslim till he wants for his brother what he wants for himself. So evidently, you don't see us as your brother because we're in a savage condition. Nobody wants us until God came to claim us as his own. So Malcolm is dead. And the sisters who were the wives of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad have been slandered. You don't ask a man if he's married, are you having sex with your wife? The question is moot. If that's my wife, I have a right to that. So why didn't Malcolm say he took wives? Why did he say teenage secretaries? Because he knew that would inflame you. And it would keep you away from Elijah Muhammad because he had become embittered. Now I conclude. In that scenario, was Malcolm worthy to sit in the seat of Elijah Muhammad and lead and be a redeemer of our people? Wait, wait, wait. How many of you ever read the story in the Bible of Noah and his sons? Did you know that Noah had three sons? Noah got all of them out of the flood. They landed on Mount Ararat, you remember? According to the Bible. He sent a raven out. The raven didn't come back. He sent a dove out. The dove came back. He came outside of the ark. According to the Bible, he got drunk and was naked laying in the sand. Two sons refused to look on his nakedness and covered him. And another son called Ham looked down at his nakedness and mocked the man who got him out of the flood. And Noah cursed him. And God upheld the curse, according to the Bible. Now you look at Elijah Muhammad. Did he get Malcolm out of Malcolm's condition? If he saw the leader in that condition, what should he have done? cover him since the leader covered him why don't you cover the leader and wait till understanding come why would you go to the enemy of both of you he became vindictive he was hurt and bitter now let me conclude. I know it's long. Don't tell me. I've been preaching all day. You know how I know Malcolm's shoes? Did you know that before Spike made the movie, that this brother was trying to make the movie Malcolm X? You didn't know that, did you? I never told you, but Brother Akba knows. Were you with me when I went overseas? Thank you. Come out here, Brother Akbar, since you've been with me a long time. <laughs> Could you stand over here? Now, Brother and I have been uh, uh, together a long time. When Godfrey Cambridge died, Brock Peters called my wife, and I was on my way to California in an automobile, and I happened to stop in New Mexico, and I called my wife, and she told me to call Brock Peters because Godfrey Cambridge, the comedian, had died, and they wanted me to speak at his funeral. I spoke at Godfrey Cambridge's funeral, and at the funeral was Maya Angelou, James Baldwin, Cicely Tyson, 
All Hollywood was there. And when it was over, we went back to Brock's house, and I was sitting with Maya Angelou and James Baldwin. And I told James Baldwin, I would like to do a movie on the life of Malcolm. I think it would be the greatest help to bring people from the street to Islam. James Baldwin said, I wrote the first script. He said, I don't know nobody that could do it better than you. He said, I'll send you the script. This was December. I said, you know, Jimmy, I'll be in Egypt in February. And he was living in southern France then. And he was to meet me in Egypt, and we were to go over the script before I went into the Middle East to get money to do the film. As Allah is my witness, he sent me the script. I read it. And when I saw Malcolm in bed with the white woman, I said, oh, no. I said, I can't play that part. We got to fix this up. So if you notice, Spike kind of handled that, you know. He tried to handle it as gingerly as he could. But with me, he wouldn't be ha have to handle it at all because I wasn't going to get near no white woman in no scene like that. Because <laughs> image, images mean a lot. Brother Akbar was with me. We were in Uganda with Idi Amin. Idi Amin called Muammar Gaddafi and told Gaddafi, I got a brother here that you have to meet. And they flew me from Egypt to Uganda and from Uganda back to Libya on Idi Amin's plane. And we missed Gaddafi. And so he had me meet with his people. And when I told his people what I had in mind about a movie, did they mock me and kind of laugh? And I had to kind of beat them up a little bit. Nothing happening. I went to Mecca and sat with the scholars in Mecca about making a movie about Malcolm X's life. And the scholars looked at me and said, it is a gangsta. All images um, is of the devil. And this is what our fathers, you know, uh, gave us. I said, and what if your father was a fool? Would you follow him? Did I jump on him, brother? I beat the hell out of him, man. Because they sounded silly to me. So I came back to America. There was no movie. And I met my brother and I stood up to rebuild the work of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Now the movie is made. But what was Warner Brothers' motive? Do you mean the Jewish people who run Warner Brothers would put $30 million behind a so-called anti-Semite? When somebody is dead, you know, it take a living person to get a dead man up out the grave. Even though many of us love Malcolm, you don't have the power to raise him from the dead, but white folks do. And for the last six years, they've been raising Malcolm in periodicals and writings that you ain't got nothing to do with. This is white folks orchestrating this. Why? Because six years ago or more, Jesse Jackson stood up to become president. Six years ago, Louis Farrakhan burst on the international scene. Six years ago, they started battling Louis Farrakhan. And every Negro that they battled, they made them book them. But Louis Farrakhan is the only one so far. He ain't bent his knee. He fought back. And God 
has blessed me to get stronger and stronger and stronger. So the white folks said, we ain't got no living black man to raise up against Louis Farrakhan. They tried it with Jesse, and it didn't work. They couldn't try it with Ben Hooks and others because they have no standing in the black community among the little people. So the only way they could get Farrakhan, they had to raise a dead man with the purpose of using a dead man against a living black man that they have no power over. I want you to listen, brother. This is their motive. They cleaned up Malcolm. They never mentioned that Malcolm was an anti-Semite. Why? They don't give a damn about Malcolm. They wanted to use Malcolm against Elijah Muhammad and bust Elijah Muhammad down as the foundation upon which I stand. But their plan was even more diabolical than that. He said, we're going to raise Malcolm and Spike born to make this film but trying to get even. Little, little vindictiveness. He makes a movie. Denzel was brilliant. I don't think they could have got a better Malcolm. They searched the world over. Denzel did that job. Even the brother that they cast to do Elijah Muhammad, though I don't like his script, he did a good job. And even though there were negative things in the movie, and yes, you know, the intent was evil, but I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, that movie will do a lot more good than any harm than it could do. It's what we do with what is generated from the film. Now look at this. Two weeks after the movie came out, CBS comes out with a documentary, The Real Truth. On Malcolm. The movie comes out and cups in it, puts in a column, Louis Farrakhan, the arch enemy of Malcolm X. <laughs> now what they're trying to do is draw me and the nation into the controversy. Because if we jumped into the controversy, then the movie would take off. And they didn't think they could build Malcolm up and we would and dog the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and we would be quiet. They just knew we were going to jump into the fray. And they were counting on that because what they really wanted to say was that Louis Farrakhan had something to do with Malcolm's assassination. They had it all fixed up. Since I was the man that came and took Malcolm's place in New York came to live in the home that was Malcolm's and had the position that once was Malcolm's, they could make a case. They thought, saying that Farrakhan was envious, turned Malcolm in to get Malcolm's spot, had Malcolm bumped off. And the agents that are working among the gangs, they would be down among you. That's why it was so important to get the youth to the movie, because they know our youth got vengeance in them. And if you niggas kill Malcolm, man, we, 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 we ought to take vengeance on them cats. You mean Farrakhan was involved in that? <laughs> then they wanted to turn the guns in the community on the nation of Islam. And if we started fighting each other, then they could bring the government forces in to round up Farrakhan in the nation of Islam. It was all set. They had Oprah Winfrey and, and uh, uh, Magic Johnson and Bill Cosby putting their money in. Because anything that your money is in, you're concerned. So if Farrakhan had come out beating down the movie, then Oprah would have been angry. Magic would have been angry. They would spread it among those people. So we would have been against the middle class and against the people that say they love us. You understand what I mean? had it all worked out, but Farrakhan was made wise to what their plan was by a hidden God. 
And Farrakhan told everybody in the nation, be quiet. I'm silencing the nation for 90 days. I don't want you out in the public saying nothing, and I'm not going out in the public saying nothing. Because they wanted to raise Malcolm and kill him all over again. They're wicked. They wanted to raise Malcolm and then kill him. Kill Elijah Muhammad again. And above all, get Farrakhan. Because the people are beginning to listen to him. But when I didn't say nothing, I got a stack of invitations from television, from Australia, from Germany, from Italy, from, uh, uh, where else? Uh, guys, in, 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 all over in Europe. Then I got all kind of offers in America. I don't have nothing to say. And everybody among us, we just went quiet and had nothing to say. You notice the nation obeyed. Nobody in the nation opened their mouth. And all of a sudden, the movie went up. And then Home Alone 2 came. <laughs> and then Bodyguard came. And then a few good men came. And then Aladdin came. And all of a sudden, they couldn't get their money out of the movie anymore. You saw it, and many of you were angry in one sense. And then some of the brothers in the hood said, I like the Malcolm that was with Elijah. Looked like Malcolm went overseas drinking tea with them white folks and sold out. Yeah. This is what some of the brothers were saying. Yeah. Then on the other hand, when they were talking about Elijah, he was just a dirty old man. People hollering out in the theaters. Now you've got the truth. I know Malcolm's shoes because I walked in them. I became the national spokesman. And dear Brother Iman, on blessed Clara Muhammad's deathbed, when she was at Mercy Hospital, she asked me to come. And I visited her. I love her like my own mother. And as the tears fell from her eyes, Brother Emmanuel, she said these words to me. She said, Brother, help my husband. He's getting up in age now. Help my husband. He's not going to let you do it. But you help him anyway. She said, it ain't nothing but jealousy. Help my husband. And look at the word. Elijah Muhammad was not jealous of me or Malcolm. You can't be a jealous person or an envious person and have the spirit of God in you. Elijah Muhammad just tried us. And I'll tell you what happened to me, Brother Iman. People begin to praise me as the national spokesman. That Malcolm was smart. He told me before we left each other who my enemies would be. He said, my enemies are going to one day be your enemies. And then he said, Brother, I wish it was you being an example for me rather than me being an example for you. He knew. I began to think as people began to praise me and the ministers started talking about me like a dog. And they began to call me names like I was going to be the hypocrite who would lead the nation astray. Imagine a man working for a, an organization 
and giving it everything he got, sacrificing his wife and his children and every bit of money that I had. You know, I was 42 years old and never had a bank account. I never owned nothing. Everything was for the nation. And some of these people talking about I was a hypocrite, stealing money and all kind of crap like that. And when I went to Elijah Muhammad ready to blow up one day, he just said these words to me. He said, brother, seek refuge in Allah from the envy of when he envies. And he got up and he walked out of the room. And when he came back, he said these powerful words. He said, brother, when you got a piece of wood and you're going to put it in the corner of the building to uphold the weight of the building, you got to put a lot of stress on that board. And if it breaks, then you know that's not the board you were looking for. You throw it away and you get you another one. What was he telling me? I'm about to put you in the corner of the nation to uphold the weight of the nation. So I got to put stress on you to see if you will break under that pressure because I can't have no weak board in the corner of my nation. I tried Malcolm and Malcolm broke under the pressure. He didn't say that, but I'm saying it. But look at what you have done to me. Some of my own brothers sought to take my life, plan my death. But I have never told one to come after you with evil. A man that you know very well, I won't call his name, robbed the nation and we were poor of $25,000 because we were trying to get back the old home of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the mosque and he said he could deliver. He needed $25,000. He was a friend of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad so he said but he took our money and the brothers were so angry they wanted to take his head. I said leave him alone. I've been slandered by my own brothers and I've been evil spoken of but I keep on plugging and you don't hear me on the radio condemning Imam Waratuddin you don't hear me on the radio speaking against those who speak against me let them say what they want my work is clear I'm a strong piece of board in the corner of the building upholding the weight, not of the tiny nation, but of 30 million or more black people in America. God has made me a better man for you than Malcolm X. I'm standing where Malcolm would have stood if he had the character to stand where I'm standing. I thank God for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the test that he gave me. And I say to all of you, stand firm behind the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and never again engage in slander, backbite. I could never willingly, willfully speak evil words against Malcolm because he said, I wish it was you being an example for me rather than me being an example for you. So God made my brother an example that I could walk better. So Malcolm died in reality that I might live. I thank Allah for his life and I grieve over his death. But I promise my Allah that I'm going to continue in the path to make the crooked things straight. 
and the rough places plain. May Allah bless all of you who love Malcolm and bless you to see that Malcolm made a mistake. And God, if it pleases him, will forgive him his mistake and grant him his place because Malcolm is still doing more for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad dead than many of us are doing alive. He's still making his teacher known. May be perverted, but with the help of God, we'll come behind and straighten it out. So I thank you all for listening. I thank you for your patience. This is a, this is a tremendous subject. A deep subject and I, I, I know it's been a long day for you but it's been a long day for me too because I preached twice before I got here and ain't no ways tired in the audience today is Prince Asiel Ben Israel would you come up Nasi struck a truce in the gang-related killings. And Nasik Asiel ben Israel and Brother Gator and these brothers, I, don't, I know that they are Hebrew Israelites. Come on up, brothers, please. Have been working with Nasik Asiel ben Israel and Brother and others. Brother Fontaine from the black disciples. Where's brother? He's on his way. These brothers have been working to bring about a truce. And I think they deserve <laughs> our gratitude. Nasi Garcia Ben Israel, Brother Gaida, Brother Fontaine. See, what the enemy doesn't understand is that God is raising an army in the streets. And these young men are generals. They're warriors and teachers. And they're tired of killing each other. And they developed a button. Here it is. And on this button, they have all the symbols that they wore under. The crescent, the five-pointed star, the six-pointed star of David. So today, we brought together my Hebrew Israelite brother from the nation of Israel with the nation of Islam. These are Hebrews and Muslims that love each other. Yes, sir. I don't know about the Jews over there now, and the Muslims, they don't get along. But these, yes, sir. we are one. Yes, sir. And so the six-pointed star of David, yes. which is a great symbol, an isosceles, two equilateral triangles, yes. one up, one down, six sides, six points, six stars, six angles and every angle 60 degrees. Beautiful symbol. The five-pointed star of the nation of Islam. Beautiful symbol and the crescent. But these are symbols. Yes, yes, sir. All they do is re represent a great truth. But you are not a symbol. You're the yes. real thing. Yes, sir. So we shouldn't let the symbols divide what the symbols were designed to to guide the real people of God yes. right. into divine unity. So I'd just like to ask Prince Asiel if he would just say a word as we close. Would you please, Prince? Uh, it's my divine pleasure, first of all, giving all praises to Allah and to you, my beloved people here. I greet you in the name of your brothers and sisters from Jerusalem 
and from Rabbi Ben Ami, your servant and brother. Let me first, Minister, take this moment because for me, I want this family to know that you're not only my leader personally, but also a father that have watched over me as you've watched me grow and develop, and that this nation, the NOI, the Nation of Islam, has been a big brother and a parent and a comforter to your brothers and sisters across the water when it was not popular, but you knew it was prophetic. And I want the people today to know that Louis Farrakhan is a true servant of Almighty God. Allah. Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. Let me say on behalf of the nations, Chairman Larry Hoover and Minister Rico and Willie Lord, let me say on behalf of Shorty Freeman, let me say on behalf of Chief Malik, and let me say on behalf of the families that have come together that we have broken the arrow and that like the prophet Isaiah, we will break our weapons of war into pruning hooks and we will build that mighty nation that will serve our people. Let me say, let me say to you so that you will be clear, you heard the minister talk about the agent provocateurs, but the only way that they could operate if they made you believe that the nation of Islam and the nation of Israel, the Hebrew nation and the Islamic nation was at war. The only way that they could function if they made you think that the GDs and the BDs and the vice lords were at war. Well, I'm here to tell you that we're moving from gangster disciple to growth and development, that we're moving from black disciple to bad disciple for God. We're moving from vice lord to lords of vision so that those who will perpetrate the agent provocateurs, we will know them, we will deliver them to their tormentors. They won't disrupt the community no more. <laughs> Let me say that this servant of God. I had the humble pleasure of standing with him the first public speaking engagement at Haki Mahabuti's when there was no official fruit of Islam around him. I and a nation minister, Prince Amishadai, stood with the minister and that day as Anwar Sadat was sitting in Jerusalem with Menachem Begin Louis Farrakhan and Prince Asiel were sitting that no longer would there be the sons and daughters of Hagar and the sons and daughter of Sarah arguing, but Abraham is our father and God is watching over both of us. And in closing, let me say to you brothers, and hear me please, the country is trying to fulfill a prophecy that by the year 2000, 70% of all black men will either be in jail, on drugs, unemployed, or dead. I'm saying to you that there is no place to, pr to proceed but back to the truth of the living God. We brothers must come back and be servants to truth. We must come back and be dedicated to truth. How will you know what that truth is? The nation of Islam did not exist after it went down. But a servant of God who had the courage and the faith to believe that his teacher was of God and a Messiah and I want you to know that I know that the Honorable Elijah was a Messiah for our people.
I want it to be clear. I heard those out there call Brother Farrakhan an apostle so that you don't be confused that he has usurped a title that he is not worthy of. In the true essence of the word apostle, it means one who has been taught by the Messiah himself and carrying out the instructions of his Lord and Savior. We must understand that I come down from Jerusalem. 25 years ago, the Spirit of God blew across America and caused us to come up out of here, not to separate from our people, but to go and prove to the world that what the messenger said about being the lost and found in America had been found, and that that was a twofold mission. If you remember, Looking at the newspaper, Muhammad speaks, you saw two hands reaching across the globe. One was on the other side back in Africa and Asia, and one was still standing in America. Well, I want you to take a look at those two hands right now. Thank you. Nasik Asiel Ben Israel. Let's hear it again. Allahu Akbar. 